church this coming week, and let us continue in prayer. Dear gracious God, we give thanks. We give thanks for just the opportunity to worship this morning, to come together in your presence, to open up your word, to, to once again turn our lives over to you, to ask your mercy and grace upon our lives. And we pray that as we look at one of the parables of Jesus, that um, you will open our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Pray. Amen. So we're at Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 29. If you heard last week, this was the passage we were going to talk about last week, um, but instead we paused for, for a little bit of time and, and our sermon was more of a time of prayer, um, to pray for our country and some of the unrest and what's going on in the world. Um, so we're going to kind of backtrack a little bit, talk about faithfulness and gentleness today and then humility um, and start our series next week. So this is Jesus um, sharing what has been called throughout the ages the parable of the talents. For it is, as, it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. And the one who had received the five talents went off and at once traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. And after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, well done, well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with two talents also came forward saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. And his master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid. And when I went and hid your talent in the ground, here, here, you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers and on my return i would have received what was my own with interest so take the talent from him and give it to the one with 10 talents for for to all those who have been for, for to all those who have more will be given and they will have an abundance but from from those who have nothing even what they have will be taken away. The word of our Lord. Amen. So what does it mean to be faithful? I was thinking about this question quite a bit a week ago yesterday. It was a Saturday afternoon. We had a wedding here at Westminster. It was a, a pretty big wedding. There's always this part in a wedding service it's right at the very beginning of a, of a pr probably most wedding services, probably all Presbyterian wedding services, right at the beginning, there's a question. It's well before the vows. Actually, when I meet with a couple before a wedding, I intentionally have to tell them that this question is not the vows. It's even before the father of the bride sits down. We ask the groom and the bride a question, which basically clears the way and says it's okay to continue with the service. Now, there's something of a rhetorical nature to this question. If they couldn't answer it yes, we wouldn't be there in the first place. And actually, I've never had anyone answer the question with a no, gratefully, because that would be awkward if they did at the beginning of a wedding service. It's an important question. I remember myself getting a little weak in the knees 
on my wedding day when I was asked this question. I got some pictures of our wedding there. And I, although was a little weak in the knees, the, the story in the family goes like this, that, that I was swaying a little bit during, during the wedding service, standing up there, kind of rocking back and forth. But I will tell you, I, I, I did keep vertical. Um, so we're going to watch a quick video. <laughs> So that was not me on my wedding day. Fortunately, I did stay vertical. But that question, which is now up on the screen, let me tell you the question, the big question we want to talk about, is understanding that God has created, ordered, and blessed the covenant of marriage, do you affirm your desire to enter this covenant, to love and to be faithful to this person as long as you both shall live? That's the question. It's called the the Declaration of Intent. Why are we there in the first place? Now that question, maybe we can put the question back up on the screen, Rick. That question, that's big. That, that's commitment. So, sure, we'll get to the vows in a little bit, the, the whole sickness and health, richer or poorer stuff, but the first question pretty much sums it up what it means to be faithful. Do you affirm your desire and intention to enter this covenant to love and be faithful as long as you both shall live? With an affirmative answer, a wedding will take place. Without an affirmative answer, it won't take place. We need faithfulness. But here's the thing about faithfulness. The question, the question might be asked once at the beginning of a wedding service, but it's answered countless times, day after day after day. When we're tempted to lose our temper, the way we respond is an answer to that question. When, when we're tempted to stray, how we proceed is how we answer that question of faithfulness. When, when we have the opportunity to forgive, whether we do it lovingly and quickly or slowly and grudgingly, depends on how we answer the question of faithfulness. When one partner becomes sick or disabled, we again have the opportunity to answer that question of faithfulness. So anyone in a marriage, or, or actually a friendship, a family relationship, a relationship with God, is presented with opportunities to display faithfulness day after day. And how we answer that question says a lot about our heart. Actually, Proverbs 3 Verses 3 and 4 says, Do not let loyalty and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and of all people. You will find favor and good repute in the sight of God means that, that our faithfulness will be noticed. So I want, I want you to think just for a minute of someone who has a good name in your book. Someone you noticed. Someone you remember because of their faithfulness, whether it's their faithfulness to God, 
to their spouse, to their children, to someone else. You know, faithfulness matters. It it means to be loyal. We forsake those things that harm our relationship. We are faithful as long as we live. You want to see some faithfulness in action? Came across this video. Faithfulness might just look like this. I don't count it a burden, whatever, to have to care for her. I I need to do everything. From the moment she gets up to the moment she goes to bed, I do absolutely everything. Um, Clean her teeth, uh, shower, dress, everything. um, But it's it's a privilege. I count it a great privilege to, to care for this one that I've loved all of these years and continue to love. This is the year when we'll celebrate our 50th wedding anniversary. Our stories have been a a lovely story. I first saw her when she was eight years old and her brother became my best friend. We grew up together and as we grew up, yeah, she was there. And I knew that she used to stare at me when I was playing footy with my, with her brother and uh, another friend and when we used to ride bikes and she kept staring at me, but I wasn't interested. I was 17, she was 16. I saw her dolled up, dressed up, and she had an A-line dress on, and boom, it was gone. I was, uh, she was the one for me then, absolutely. <laughs> when we first started uh, dating, I used to ride my bike from where I lived to where she was, and that was about five kilometers on a Saturday afternoon, because it was the only chance we had to get together. And uh, it was hair wash day for her and she used a special cream in her hair for a shampoo. And I can still smell it, because that smell was so particular, so nice. It was just absolutely special. We had a bike. I used to ride everywhere on my bike, and then Glad had a bike as well, and we put a, a baby chair on the front of her bike, and so we carried our babies around on the bike with her as well. So, yeah, bike's been part of our lives, and I guess that has something to do with us now. Around about 2004 5, I began to notice um, that there were things going wrong. She was finally diagnosed with uh, the horrible disease of Alzheimer's. Having lived overseas, I knew that with a bike you can do lots of things. So I had a bike made, a bike chair made. We take it to the beach and ride along beside the beach. And as we do that, we see lots of people. A lot of people come talk to us because it's a a unique thing. Nobody else has got a bike chair quite like that one. I am determined to care for her every need, every need. You see, God has loved us so unconditionally. And I understand that God has put his love in my heart. And because I realize how much God has loved me, that's how I too can love my lovely wife. She has done so much for me over all of these years. Now she can't, but I can, and I can return her love. Uh, And it's a love that, uh, well, to me, means I can do everything for her. She's my princess, I'm her William, and I wouldn't (laughs) have it any other way. Would you have it any other way? No, No, no. No, not at all. We love each other. He, he chose, the man in our video, he chose to be faithful. He made the decision all those years ago. But what really matters is he chooses day after day after day, moment after moment, to be faithful. Maybe that's why faithfulness is one of the virtues found in those who follow Christ. You know, we've been talking a lot about Paul's, the Apostle Paul's list in Galatians of the fruit of the Spirit those fruit that's in a believer's life, and in those lists, he lists faithfulness. The word in the Greek is actually pistis, or faith, but, but the way Paul uses it is, is in a way that has the meaning of fidelity, or, or actually the character of one who can be relied on. Isn't that a great definition of faithfulness? The character of one who can be relied on. And we find that this characteristic of faithfulness is part of the Christian life because faithfulness is a characteristic of God. You know, we see in the Old Testament time and time again how God 
was faithful to the people of Israel. The psalmist said in Psalm 36, 5, Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. See, we need not look any further than God for an example of faithfulness, and we need not look any further than Jesus for an example of faithfulness. You know, just think of the New Testament when, when Jesus, when, when his hometown, Jesus' hometown people tried to push him off a cliff, Jesus didn't quit. He kept going. He kept ministering, teaching, preaching. When, when his family, remember this story, his family thought he was out of his mind. Jesus just kept loving them. When, when Jesus was accused of lying about God, he was accused of blasphemy, Jesus remained faithful. When his friends misunderstood his teachings, he loved them until they understood. He didn't write them off. When, when Peter called him the Christ and then denied him, Jesus stayed faithful to the course. When he was even condemned to death on a cross, Jesus prayed that, that God, the Father, would forgive them, would forgive the people that were crucifying him. See, faithfulness is not a one-time event. It is a lifetime of steady reliability. And it doesn't mean that because you, you want to be faithful, you let people walk all over you. So let's just pause here and, and clear that up. Faithfulness is not a, a weak attribute. It's a strong attribute. You want to be faithful. It doesn't mean you let people wipe their feet at your doorstep or you, be, you have to become a victim or you have to be passive. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus taught that we are to be faithful to God and people throughout our lives. But in the context of wisdom and discernment, Jesus actually said, be as, as wise as serpents but as gentle as doves. So we're asked to be faithful to one another. We know that God is faithful to us, but we're also asked to be faithful to God. And that is where we look at the parable of the talents, this unique parable that is a little wordy, repeats itself quite a bit. But in the parable of the talents, Jesus talks about this man who was going to leave the country. He brings in three of his servants and gives them a certain amount of his goods to each one. To the first, he gives five talents. To the second, he gives two talents. To the third, he gives one talent. Now, a talent in this story meant money. It represented the largest unit of accounting in Greek currency. It equaled 10,000 denarii. So in this parable, a denarius represents a day's wage. A talent, then, is a lifetime of earnings and that's the point of the parable. God has given each of us a large investment. And what does he expect in return? Faithfulness to that investment. Faithfulness. The first two servants doubled what was given to them. The last did nothing. In God's response to the five talent and two talent servants, he said, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. See, Jesus in this parable is teaching us that God is looking for us to be faithful to him with all that we have and all that we are, not just once, not just when we were baptized or confirmed or joined the church or had a mountaintop experience at a retreat, but to be faithful, not once, but every day. And not, not just to others, not just to our spouse or our friends or our family members, but, but to God, to be faithful to God. There, there's a great story about Senator Mark Hatfield. Some of you may have heard it. Senator Hatfield was touring Calcutta with Mother Teresa, and they were visiting the, the House of the Dying, is what they called it, where, where sick children are cared for in their last days. And also, this is the place outside where, where the poor lined up by hundreds to receive medical attention. Well, Hatfield watched Mother Teresa minister to those people, feeding and nursing those left by others to die. 
Health Hatfield, Senator Hatfield, was completely overwhelmed by the sheer magnitude of the suffering. Mother Teresa and her co-workers had to experience on a daily basis. How can you bear the load without being crushed by it? He asked her. And Mother Teresa replied this. He said, my dear Senator, I am not called to be successful. I am called to be faithful. She had a talent, a lifetime of ability, and she was faithful with it. She put her very life to work for it. Is there any doubt when, when she died, she heard, well done, good and faithful servant. That brings us real quickly to our next virtue, this, this virtue of gentleness. You know, gentleness is rooted in our belief in humanity. Mother Teresa believed in humanity. That's, that's what drove her to do what she did. When, when we see people the way God sees them, we're compelled to treat them well, to be faithful to them. And a gentle person, according to God's vision, according to what the Bible tells us about gentleness, that, that a gentle person is a thoughtful person. They think before they act. They think before they talk. They are considerate. They, they consistently put themselves in other people's shoes and they act accordingly. A gentle person is calm. They're known for their, their even temper and positive energy. Jesus modeled this for us throughout the gospel stories. And you know, these two virtues, they go so well together because, because gentleness is how we are faithful to one another. We are faithful with the virtue of gentleness. So today, may, may we be faithful with that spirit of gentleness to our friends, to our family members, to our spouse, to God. To be loyal with your whole being, forsaking things that would break our relationships with God and others, devoted as long as we live. It might not be easy. We know it's not easy, but it's right. And the good news is that we don't have to be perfect all by ourselves. It is, it is, as Paul told us, it is a fruit of the Spirit. So God will, will give you and me this gift of faithfulness and gentleness. So let us walk closely with God, knowing that as we do, this fruit will, will, will grow naturally within us. And God will give us favor and a good name. Let us pray.